Hello, it's Monday, September 25th, 2017 at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Special Edition. I am your host, Andrea Boyle-Tippett from the University of Delaware. On today's live broadcast, we're speaking with an attorney who will give us insights into to developing more beneficially, mutually beneficial relationships with your school's own general counsel. In this session, we'll discuss keys to addressing your lawyer's concerns while still getting to effectively do your job. Today's Higher Ed Special Edition is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Be part of the live broadcast like today's by sharing your knowledge and questions. We ask that you participate in the discussion by tweeting with the hashtag Higher Ed Live. So again, that hashtag is Higher Ed Live. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. Have you ever wondered what prospective teens are thinking when they receive and read or ignore your institution's recruitment marketing materials? The third study in the, the third study in the myth busting series in partnership with NRCCUA is the first to focus on the complete enrollment marketing mix. The research will uncover the best marketing channels and communications preferences that have the biggest influence on prospective teens' perception of your institution. Sign up now and receive early access to the research results and a white paper. It's are free and easy to access in the video archives at higheredlive.com, or you can take it on the go with you by subscribing to the podcast. Today's episode is made possible by PRSA's Counselors to Higher Education Professional Interest Section. Counselors to Higher Ed provides PR professionals working in colleges and universities with a few things. Publications, terrific networking opportunities, and virtual and live events, as well as in insights into the best ways to promote the value, power, and appropriate role of communications and marketing functions within higher ed, higher ed institutions. And now, let's chat with today's guest. Mark Weaver is an attorney at, who is also a communications advisor with decades of experience. Previously, he served as Ohio Attorney General and was responsible for crisis management and acted as chief spokesperson. He's an adjunct faculty member at a number of institutions, including the Ohio State University College of Law, the University of Akron, and the School of Government at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition, he is author of the book, A, Words, a Wordsmith's Work. He has worked with several higher education institutions over the course of his career, and I would also like to note that, like me, he is a proud University of Delaware Blue Hen. Mark, welcome. Well, thank you, and happy Monday, everybody. This is Mark Weaver. Um, I'm going to, in a moment, show you my slides, but I wanted to say hello so you can see what it looked like before we get started here. Uh, you should have the handouts. Please follow along. And, and those are being tweeted out, just so everyone knows that um, we have them being tweeted out, and so you can grab them online while while Mark's speaking. Super. All right. So I'm going to give you my screen here, so you can see the uh, the title of our presentation is "Arm Wrestling with University Council: How to Win Every Time." Now, I don't literally, of course, mean arm wrestling, but it feels like arm wrestling sometimes when you're talking to your lawyer. And as, as Andrea told you, uh, my name is Mark Weaver. I have a company called Communications Council. We are headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, you can find out more about us at communicationscouncil.com. You heard a little bit about my background. I was the Deputy Attorney General of Ohio for five years, where we advised all of the state higher education institutions. And I handled crisis communications for all of the legal cases for the state of Ohio. Prior to that, I was spokesman for the United States Department of Justice in Washington, and I've been a lawyer since 1989. I'm admitted to practice in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and in the District of Columbia. So my background has been pretty diverse between both representing clients in the court of law and advising clients in the court of public opinion. In fact, as you heard, I am an adjunct faculty member at these institutions here and at the uh, Ohio State University College of Law, the class I teach is what lawyers can say to the press during litigation or investigations. I'm often brought in by colleges and uh, law schools, grad schools, when they are in litigation or when there's a crisis and their lawyers are saying, well, we can't say anything. The legal rules are such that we can't say anything. Well, that's simply not true. We're going to talk about the legal rules a little bit today. 
And so the fact that I've taught this area at Ohio State Law School for the last several years gives me both the legal background and the practical experience to be able to give advice to higher education institutions that are in, in crisis. And for those of you who are on Twitter, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. I'm sorry. Just to interrupt, I don't think that we're seeing your slides. Oh, well, then we're I... Seeing your, we're seeing your lovely face, and so... Yeah, we don't want to see my face. We want a <laughs> slide share, so... Let me find my slide share button and tell me if you're seeing them now. We are still seeing you. Wow. Well, let me click the share button and give it another try. There we go. Hey, Success. how about these cool slides, friends? For no <laughs> extra cost, you get cool slides. All right. So that's the title, Arm Wrestling with the University Council. That's me. There's my company, Communications Council. You heard about my background, and you heard about where I teach. And the key part here is your lawyer will uh, probably back down a little bit when you hear when he hear he or she hears that you're you're giving them advice from somebody who teaches this area in law school. If you're one of my Twitter friends, uh, please say hello to me on Twitter. I'm at Mark R. Weaver. I will say hello back to you. Uh, I mostly tweet out stuff about communications and the law and crisis, and sometimes uh, media law, that sort of stuff. So let's get started. Let's, ju let's jump into it. I don't know how we do evaluations. Maybe our evaluations are on Twitter, but I promise every time I speak, and I'm doing about eight days a month of seminar training around the country. I'll be in Nevada later this week doing it, for example. I was in California last week. Uh, but I do read the evaluations. I try to get better. And I actually collect funny evaluation remarks. So these photos are my actual trainings. And it's funny what people say about lawyers. This was the first one that caught my attention. These are all real. Somebody wrote, Mark was interesting, educational, and informative. You'd never know he's a lawyer. <laughs> it kind of struck me. So I started looking for other comments and now you'll find them. Here's one. Uh, great content, good humor, and above average grooming. Okay. I'll take that. Here's another one. This is, uh, you have to zoom in close to see what this one is. Ah, Mark is a very engaging speaker and not creepy at all. My mother. That makes me worry about people's um, perceptions of speakers and what they're really looking for. And like, if not being creepy about? is a... Notice somebody's complaining about the green beans or about peanut butter as well. But anyhow, here's my favorite one. I only know three lawyers I don't want to punch in the throat. Now I know four. <laughs> That's my favorite recent evaluation remark. It, it gives you a sense of what people think about lawyers. And uh, as you'll see today, I try to debunk some of those myths. Let's jump into the material and then I welcome your questions. Please ask them on Twitter and uh, I'll be happy to answer them. So the, the struggle we have now in higher education, whenever we're in crisis with either litigation, investigations, or how about this one, demonstrations and protests, and we all know that's happening. There's a struggle between two very good, smart sets of people. On the one side, we have PR pros like yourself who understand how to defend your college or university's reputation in the middle of a crisis. You know what it takes to make sure that your brand is protected. You know what it takes so that guidance counselors can continue to recommend your school. Parents want to come visit. Students want to sign up. Donors want to donate. Legislators want to leave you alone. You know what it takes to do that. There's another set of people, though, who need to be listened to, and those are the lawyers. They have learned what, <clears throat> what it takes to defend you in the court of law, to protect you from paying out big money in litigation liability, which of course can lead to a lot of other bad things when you're sued and you lose. It can lead to lowered enrollment, lower uh, co contributions from donors. So on either side of this tug of war, we've got two good sets of people, each of whom wants to win, and each of whom is in the ear of your university president. A lot of my clients are university presidents. I understand the mentality of university president. They like to please people. They hate conflict. They don't want to make tough decisions. That's, gener that's a, a generality, but more, more often than not, that's what I found with university presidents. Good people there for the good reason, but when there's a struggle like this, they will often err on the side of the lawyers because the lawyers start talking Latin or throwing out statutes or case numbers. And uh, 
if the college president's a non-lawyer, they just presume, well, I better be careful. I'm going to listen to my lawyer. And that often leaves the PR pros shut out of the discussion. The reason why I entitled this uh, presentation arm wrestling with your lawyer, because that's what it feels like you're doing when you're sitting there in the president's conference room trying to help the president make a good decision about what to do in this situation. And so my view is neither side should win the tug of war. We all know what happens when one side wins the tug of war. Everybody on the other side falls over. We've seen it all the time. That's how tug of wars end. In our university setting, we need to have both sides, PR pros and lawyers win. Here's what happened when only one side wins, right? When it's the lawyers deciding our press strategy, we know what their recommendation is. They tell us to say, no comment. That's the favorite phrase of lawyers. And when, when, we, when, when the lawyers win, what do the headlines look like? Well, they look like these kind of headlines. No comment, no comment, no comment, no comment, no comment. I tell lawyers that I speak to, stop recommending your clients saying no comment. You might as well say, I'm guilty. You might as well say, I like to strangle puppies. In fact, more people would like you for saying I like to strangle puppies than no comment because no comment, as we as PR people know, essentially is an admission of whatever the worst criticism is made against you. So if the lawyers get their way and they totally convince the president about how to approach the situation, we're going to get a bunch of no comments and all of the allegations will be presumed true in the court of public opinion. However, I should note that when the PR pros win, when they win the tug of war and beat out the attorney, bad things can happen as well. And that could be additional liability in the court of law. Uh, there are lots of good, smart PR people who give advice like this. And I saw this on the internet when Joan Rivers, the comedian, died. Uh, and she was under the care of a doctor. Uh, several people on the internet were suggesting that maybe the doctor should just come out and say something like this. There was a breach in the trust recently that Joan's family gave us, and we found that completely unacceptable. Now, remember, these are doctors going to be sued for what happened with her, and some PR people suggest that they should have come out and said there's a breach in this trust. Be aware, when I show the slide you're looking at right now to lawyers groups, there's a gasp in the room that anybody would suggest saying this. And that's because one of the things that has to be proved when a lawsuit is brought against somebody for negligence is that there was a trust that was breached. And the notion of coming out and admitting something that's the key element of winning a lawsuit takes lawyers' breath away. Similarly, on the internet, there were PR people who, again, otherwise good people, suggesting that it's just a good thing to come out and admit fault. You know, don't even worry about apologizing. Just get out there and admit frankly. And in one case, when VW got caught up in a lawsuit, someone suggested that we should just say, we meaning VW, I wasn't involved, but VW should say, we deliberately flouted the law. Lawyers are aghast at the notion of these sort of admissions. They might help in the court of public opinion. They will hurt. They will cost money in the court of law. There's got to be a better solution. And the solution, I think, is allowing lawyers and PR pros to both make their case to the president or the decision maker and get a final answer that allows the lawyers to do what they need to do, protect us from legal liability, and allows the PR people to do what they do, which is to protect us from reputational liabilities. So how can you win when your lawyer starts spouting off in Latin and quoting cases and saying, tut, tut, you just don't understand? Well, first of all, you need to understand the mentality of the lawyer who's advising you. These are good people. I've represented lots of universities, both as a lawyer. I've represented Ohio State in a high-profile state Supreme Court case years ago. Uh, and I, so I know what it's like to be the lawyer for a university. My job is to make sure the lawyer or that the university doesn't lose money. But most lawyers don't want to be challenged for a couple of reasons. And, and, and largely that's because they think they're smarter than most people. It's kind of the required course in law school, you know, lawyers think they're smarter. Uh, and that's not true, of course. Lawyers are just smarter in their own knowledge than, than, than other people are, and PR people are smarter in their knowledge. But helping you understand what keeps your lawyer up at night will allow you to address those concerns 
with your lawyer and get to the resolution where both sides win, where you get to protect the reputation and the lawyer gets to protect the liability. So here's some of the things lawyers worry about. They worry about liability. They worry about your university having to pay out big dollars because you were sued. And those big dollars include paying legal fees, by the way, because even if you win the case, you'll win it two or three years down the road and you'll have paid your lawyer hundreds of thousands of dollars. And those are dollars that could go into more teachers, better dormitories, more programming, whatever the university needs. The liability that lawyers worry about um, comes in a couple different flavors. Criminal, civil, and regulatory are the three big areas that lawyers are trained to look out for. And if you understand this, you'll be able to help guide your lawyer through this discussion. Your lawyer will be appreciative that you understand these, <coughs> these three areas of concern. So let's walk through them one by one. Let's first look at the criminal area of liability. Here's what I mean. Somebody on your campus right now, I hate to be the one that breaks this to you, Someone on your campus right now is violating the law. It could be a staff member, it could be a faculty member, it could be a student. But if it's a staff or faculty member and they're violating the law, you may have to get a, take a press call about why they were doing it. Or if you should have known they were doing it, potentially there's some criminal action as well that could be a problem. Several universities around the country right now are facing federal criminal charges for a variety of things where uh, a criminal court could find them guilty of violating the law. This is the first thing that lawyers worry about is criminal liability, particularly when it's one of your staffers or one of your faculty members. Um, so your lawyer is worried that if you say something uh, that could um, violate or hurt our position in a criminal case, they're worried that somebody might be prosecuted and that our statement would be used as evidence to send them to go to prison. Well, <clears throat> here's the reality. That's probably not gonna happen even though the lawyer's worried about it. And one way to protect your institution when there's a criminal liability problem is to <clears throat> separate the university from that student or university employee and don't take on the role of spokesperson for that person. You don't want to be the spokesperson for the faculty member who is alleged to have been uh, cheating people um, out of their finances. Maybe it's one of your business professors who's got a, a personal finance practice where they advise people on their finances and it turns out they're stealing money from little old ladies. <clears throat> Although that person works for you, you cannot and should not be the spokesperson for that unit for that person at your university and tell the, your lawyer that you don't want to do that in fact encourage your president and your board of trustees to separate yourself from that person they need to be an ex employee as fast as possible i'm familiar with tenure requirements i understand about union contracts trust me you'd sooner have a tenure or union contract problem than a criminal working on your campus problem that you have to defend day in and day out. Let me give you an example. This guy here was a high school teacher at a very prominent high school in, in the greater central Ohio area. And it turned out that he was commit, committing sexual crimes in the classroom with students. And so the, uh, the school district hired me to help them with this. And one of my first pieces of recommendation, this is not as a lawyer, this is as a crisis communicator, was fire this person. Separate yourself from this person so that you can begin talking about he no longer works for us. And so this is a headline from one of the stories. Once they finally fired him, they, he was called an ex, the school district is called Olin Tangi. He was an ex Olin Tangi teacher, not a current one. And after a while, the focus of the media as his case was going to trial switched from the district, the school, if you will, over to him and his lawyer, which is where we want it to be. So we can convince our lawyers that we will work with them. We want to be able to comment that this person no longer works for us, that we took the steps necessary to separate that potential criminal person from the university environment so that no longer will the media come around talking to you. 
Okay. We're still talking about liability. The second form of liability that the lawyers worry about is civil liability. They're worried about you being sued and having to pay out big dollars. And your lawyer's going to tell you, here's why we have to say no comment, because when we get sued, whatever we say to the press can be used against us in court. And that's why I want us to say no comment. That's the fear of the lawyer, that your comments, you as the spokesperson, will be exhibit A as to why the university owes money in whatever the lawsuit's about. When your lawyer says that, tell them that the PolitiFact truth meter says that's half true. That's not completely true. Here's what I want you to remind the lawyer is you're going to make a statement. You've got to have your president on board with this notion. There's going to be a statement from the university. We don't say things like we don't comment about litigation. That's, that's a fool's errand to do that. Now, no comment in any form is an admission in the media, in the court of public opinion. So there's going to have to be a statement. So you say to the lawyer, number one, you can edit our statement. We don't want to say anything that's going to hurt the university. So lawyer, there's going to be a statement. President agrees with me on this. You can edit what we say. That's a good first step. Some lawyers will say, sorry, no statement at all, because whatever can, you put in that statement can still be used against us. Well, here's another way to go, and this is the second solution. When the lawyer files the pleading, the pleading is simply the legal paper that we file after we've gotten sued. We take the statement that you wanted to say and we put it in the first paragraph of the pleading. Okay, so here's a pretend lawsuit uh, against that um, award winning university. Some of you may have graduated from the Banana Stand University, one of my favorites. <laughs> but let's say Lucille Bluth is suing Banana Stand University. And we would like to say some things about her that she deleted some of our records. She lied to her supervisors. That's really why uh, we fired her, not because she was sexually harassed. When you take your statement and put it right in that first paragraph, which you see that I've done there, it is a privileged document and you cannot be sued for things that are put in your privileged document. So there's that statement I was telling you about that you would write, right? Uh, that would allow you to say all the good things about Banana Stand University, equal opportunity, the fairness, we treat women well, uh, she's making stuff up, all the stuff that your lawyer says, oh, I'm worried about how that might be used against us. By putting it in the first page of your response, it will be privileged and you cannot be sued for things that go in there. And you then, when you give reporters copies of your response, they can quote from that response and use that in the story so you can push back. Uh, as a spokesman at the Justice Department, as the Deputy Attorney General of Ohio, I've done this dozens of times and it's very effective. My first preference is to get in the news cycle and say what we want to say. But if the lawyer won't let you do that, then you go here. But let me give you a tip with the lawyer. What I always say to the lawyer is, hey, are you going to deny these allegations in your, in your documents? And the lawyer goes, darn straight, I'm going to de deny them in our court documents. And I say to the lawyer, then why won't you let us deny them in the press? If you're going to deny them in the court documents, why can't we deny them in the press? And that should get the lawyer thinking because you ought to be able to deny them in the both court of, the, court of law and the court of public opinion. Hey, Mark, can I ask you a practical question about the privilege? Sure, let's go back to that. So oftentimes, what you've got in your uh, filing here, it's going to come too late often for a, a media, the media cycle, right? Yes. Um, so what you're saying is that if you write something similar to this as the official statement, it would then be privileged because it's included in the filing. Is that fair to say? Right. If we put this out outside of the lawsuit, a lawsuit, it's not privileged. Although if you're sure of what you're saying, and if the lawyer's going to be saying it anyway, I would make the case to the lawyer, you're already saying it in court. Let me say it in public. Okay, great. So for, let me go back to this example. If it's true that Lucille Bluth illegally deleted, deleted our records, and I just had a case like this recently where one of the employees was illegally deleting records, and we pointed it out. We were saying so in court, and I said so in the press on behalf of my client. Uh, and if we have evidence that she lied about it to the supervisors, we point that out to the press too. Oh, Mark, the lawyers will say, that's defamation of character. You say, hold it, lawyer. 
if it's true, it's not defamation of character. And here's the evidence why it's true. And so I'd like you to say this in the same media cycle that you get the question. If the lawyer says no, in a few moments, we'll talk about holding statements that you can use so the lawyer feels better that we're not saying anything about the substance of the case. But for now, use this tactic if you have to put it in the pleading words privilege. The, the third category of liability is regulatory, and the rules are largely similar to what we've discussed for civil. And that means if you're going in front of a regulatory agency, you ought to be able to put your side in these privileged documents like this. So back to the topic of what keeps lawyers up at night. We talked about liability for the last few minutes. Lawyers are also worried about ethics. Um, trust me, it was hard to get my law degree. It took me four years. I went at night. I worked during the day and uh, doing crisis communications and went to law school at night. And it, taking the bar exam sucks and paying my bar dues every year is no fun. And so I value my law license as most lawyers do. And ethics is an area where a law license can be taken away from a lawyer. And that's one of the things lawyers worry about. You don't have a law license to be taken away. A lawyer does. And so they're extra careful because of these ethical rules. So your lawyer is going to tell you, you know, we're not allowed to talk to the press during litigation. This is very common. Lawyers will say that. Uh, trust me on this one. We're not allowed to talk to the press. Here's what I want you to say to that lawyer with, with all good humor and respect. I want you to say, that's wrong, chucklehead. Now, maybe you won't call him chucklehead. Maybe you know him well enough to call him chucklehead. But it's certainly wrong. It's not a factual statement of the law. I mentioned to you this is the area I teach at Ohio State Law School. Uh, there are lots of things you can say to the press during litigation, and it's all governed by what's called Rule 3.6. Uh, in some, in a minority of states in America, there's a different rule called DR 7107, uh, but most states it's Rule 3.6, and it's su substantially the same whether you're the DR 7107 or whether you're the Rule 3.6. This is the lawyer's ethics rule on what a lawyer can say, and. Uh, let me just walk you through it so you understand, so you can be aware of what your lawyer's worried about. The first part of the rule says a lawyer who's participating in a case, that's your lawyer. By the way, that's not you. You are allowed to talk to the press and the lawyer cannot be disciplined for it unless the lawyer told you what to say. And even then, arguably not, because you've got a free speech right that you didn't give up just because the lawyer took a bar exam and, and became a member of the bar. So first of all, the rule only applies to lawyers who are working on the case. Number two, it only applies to an extrajudicial statement. Look at the maroon letters here. You'll see what I'm talking about. Extrajudicial simply means outside of court. That's why we talked about putting the statement in the document where people can uh, get it out of the pleadings. Because when it's in, in an in-court statement, it doesn't. it's not covered by this rule. So it's got to be a lawyer working on the case, talking outside of court, and the lawyer must know that they're talking to the press. That's what knows uh, being disseminated by means of public communication. And then here's the key point that has a substantial likelihood of material prejudicing the case. What is the substantial likelihood? Uh, I call that buttload. It's got a buttload of likelihood of material prejudice. That means really screwing up the case. I'm trying to translate for you here because I'm bilingual. I speak both English and lawyer. And so as I go through here, I'm trying to translate from the English, from the lawyer to the English. So one, here, let me give you something your lawyer can't say. It's two weeks before the trial from the family of the student who was killed on your campus by another student. And that family alleges that, and I, I handled one of these cases when I was at the Attorney General's office. In fact, it was a public safety officer who raped and killed the young co-ed. Uh, and so you can imagine the lawsuit brought against the public university. And so the lawsuit's coming up, and let's say the jury's going to come out in two, uh, the jury's going to be impaneled in two weeks. So we're two weeks away from a jury trial in a very high profile murder case. And your lawyer steps out, talks to the press, and says, you know, I've got all sorts of evidence of why the uh, witnesses in this case are lying, and they're all known to be liars, and I've got lots of people in the community who say that they're liars. That's going to violate 3.6 for a variety of reasons. We're on the verge of trial. So the jurors are reading about the case 
right before they're going to become jurors. You're offering up evidence that may or may not come into court. And by the way, the example of using people's reputation as liars is a very dicey one in court. So I'm offering up really sketchy uh, evidence right before the trial by the lawyer. That's a good example of a violation of 3.6. Let me give you the opposite example of something that would not be a violation. Something that would not be a violation would be the moment you're sued, putting forward your position on whether this lawsuit is substantive or valid or meritorious. You're allowed to do that. Your lawyer's allowed to do that. There's no notion that everybody has to go silent the moment you're sued. Did you notice that the person who sued you went right to the press with their lawsuit? In some cases, you'll find out about the lawsuit because the, the press called you, not because you got served. That's happened to me countless times in my career. We find out about the lawsuit because the press has it first. The other side got to talk to the press. You also get to talk to the press, particularly in that early stage when people are making up their minds. Okay, so the, this ethics rule, we've looked at 3.6, it applies to your lawyer. And unless you're a direct agent of your lawyer, it does not apply to you or the university. The university has a right to speak. The university is allowed to speak. You know, a lot of talk about First Amendment lately in America. I teach First Amendment law as well. First Amendment applies to universities as well as students. Universities have a right to speak. We're a little bit off topic, but when I've got university clients who call me up and say, oh my gosh, uh, a professor went on Facebook and said, all little kittens should be drowned. I'm making that example up, of course, because I'm trying to avoid a more controversial example. Oh, the professor is the, the local chairperson of the Society to Drown Little Kittens. Uh, what should we do? Well, the professor has a First Amendment right to say such a heinous thing, and the university has a First Amendment right to say that that professor is wrong and a bad person and shouldn't be saying such terrible things. You're allowed to say your side just like the other side can say their side. That's the First Amendment. Now, sometimes there's a gag order. That means the judge in the case has said, nobody talks to the press or you go to jail. They don't usually say it quite that firmly, but contempt of court could lead to going to jail. And so the lawyer will say, there's a gag order. That means we can never talk to the press. Well, again, depending on your relationship with your lawyer, you should say, try again, legal scholar, because that's not quite true. There are things you can say that don't talk about the case. And I'm going to give you some examples right now, and then I'm going to give you a downloadable resource where you can actually get some examples of this, okay? I call them general noncommittal responses. Some people call them holding statements. They fall into essentially four categories the last one of which we just mentioned, gag order. So this is for when you have to give a comment, but you don't know the facts yet, uh, or you aren't ready to, to say the facts yet, but the media cycle is moving ahead without you. So the first category is aspirational. That means who we are as a university, what we stand for, what we believe in. You can always talk about that. That's better than no comment. You don't need to know the facts of the case to know that you want to be a place where everyone's treated fairly. Procedural, that's simply explaining how the process goes. We got a complaint, we're looking into it, we take it seriously, we will get back to you. That's a procedural comment, that's better than no comment. More to come is an acknowledgement that people are waiting for you to give an answer. And rather than just going radio silent, you explain why how important it is and why you're taking the time to get it right and you'll be giving an answer soon. That's better than no comment. And then there's gag order, and that means explaining that there's a gag order rather than simply not returning reporters' calls. So let's take a case study where your university has been sued by a, a female employee for sexual harassment. This is one of the most common civil litigations universities see in America. So you don't want to talk about the facts of the case yet because you don't know the facts of the case yet. Your lawyer says, we don't know the facts. And you say, but a reporter wants to know right now what we have to say. Here's an example of something you can say. Our goal is to treat all our employees fairly and follow the law. More than half of our senior staff are women, and we're committed to fair and equal treatment for all. None of this binds you to a position in the individual case where you're being sued. And that statement allows the university to be heard from in that first media cycle 
rather than saying no comment or not being available for comment. That's an example of an aspirational comment. A procedural comment. Again, this is when you can't, for some reason, respond to the specifics of the lawsuit. This is a procedural comment. This lawsuit is just an allegation. FYI, all lawsuits are simply allegations. Our attorney will soon file court report uh, papers that show how and why these allegations are wrong. That's just explaining what's going to happen. Well, what do you mean, Mark? How do you know our attorney's going to file that? Because the attorneys file those court papers in every single case, denying liability. That's how it works. They actually have a very limited window, typically a month or so, to file those papers. So it's going to happen. And you saying it's going to happen gives you the ability to make it seem as though this lawsuit is not correct without commenting on the specifics of the case. Third category, of course, is the more to come. And that's where simply they won't let you say anything. So rather than go radio silent and get the old banana stand university refuse to comment, you at least explain that you take it seriously. We're looking into this. We want to get back to you. We'll respond more later this week or later today or later or whatever. And then that last category, when the judge has said you can't talk about a case, we don't ignore press calls when there's a gag order. We explain the gag order. And that makes us seem reasonable and prudent. So the judge has asked us not to discuss the details of the case in the press. We respect her order. And we will present our case aggressively in court. The judge will not be mad at you for saying that. And you will have said something other than no comment. If you want these examples and others I have, an officer-involved shooting, I've done a bunch of those cases recently, you can get them from a media crisis communications card I have where you see these examples in detail. You can download that right there at that URL, tinyurl.com forward slash media emergency card. It's got on the one side sort of what to do in a crisis, the steps to take when you're communicating in a crisis. And on the other side, as we just discussed, it's got those general responses. So download that. I'll put it back up there in a second in case you were writing. tinyurl.com forward slash media emergency card will give you the PDF of that card so you can look at it and share it on campus. Lawyers are also worried about regulatory problems, uh, and that's something that keeps them up at night. And if you can understand that, you're going to be able to win your disputes with them. And they are, of course, most worried about the evil and terrible and frightening FERPA, which when I first heard it sounded like a bodily noise to me. But I've, uh, of course, learned later that it's a federal law. And our lawyer is going to say something like, you know, we can't talk about that topic or we can't release this document because it will violate FERPA. And they live in fear of FERPA. It's almost like it's, you know, a horror movie. FERPA, 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 the FERPA are coming. Uh, and we do need to take FERPA seriously, but I'm going to give you some suggestions about why we're taking it perhaps a little too seriously. Um, the reality um, about FERPA is, look, look at this quote here about using FERPA to withhold disciplinary records of students or using FERPA to withhold athletic records from students. Somebody once said, those examples provide zero harm to the kids. That's not what we intended. The law needs to be revamped. Institutions are putting their own meaning into the law. You know who said that about these uses of FERPA? How about that guy there? James Buckley, the guy who wrote FERPA, FERPA is also called the Buckley Amendment because Buckley there wrote it. So the, the person who wrote it in Congress was of the view that FERPA is being misinterpreted by colleges and universities, but that's not all. Paul Gamble, who used to run the U.S. Department of Education FERPA compliance, said, it sounds like some institutions are using this act to hide things. Our office is as concerned about its use as its misuse. So FERPA has been over applied. Don't take my word for it. Ask Buckley or Gamble, who are in better position to know about that. Having said that, your lawyer is still going to wave the FERPA flag at you. And when that happens, here's what I think you should say. This is your move when the lawyer says FERPA, FERPA, FERPA. Hey, friendly lawyer. Are the records in question that you would, that I, the PR person, would like to release, are these really education records? Because FERPA only applies to education records. 
And, you know, look at the definition with the lawyer. If it is, not everything at a university is an education record, FYI, particularly public universities, by the way, who have public records acts. Um, and then if they, okay, they prove to you somehow that these are education records, that's fine. Then you say, is this really personally identifiable information or could can we redact something where we would be able to take out the personally identifiable information and release the rest of the record? That will allow you to release that document that you want to release because it helps your position. It helps your reputation. How about this? You could say to the lawyer, "Can't doesn't this fall into the exception for directory information? Because directory information by FERPA's own words are not part of FERPA. They don't get protected by FERPA. Ask your lawyer to have that discussion with you. Have them show you how this applies so that you can reach a meeting of the minds. So let's say it is completely FERPA covered. I had this case once where a student at a large university was accusing us of things that weren't true. And we knew it wasn't true and we had records that could show it wasn't true, but that they were FERPA covered. And so we asked the student and the student's family to waive their FERPA rights so that we could release it. They refused to do so. And it became part of our talking points to the media against this horrendous untrue allegation. Part of our response was, we have some records that would completely contradict these allegations. We've asked the student to waive th their rights so that we can release them, and the student has refused to do that. And we encourage the press to ask the student why they don't want that information out there. It flipped the script on the false allegations made against the school. Um, this is one of the cases where I did that, where a, a, law, a, uh, a local school district was uh, accused of having a staffer who was bullying a 14-year-old special needs student. And it really, a lot of the allegations were untrue. This would become a national story. And we use that uh, specific example to push back and say the family will not give us a FERPA waiver. And uh, if, you, if we did, you'd see that these allegations are false. Okay. And the last thing to say to your lawyer, and if you really want to be a wise ass, uh, there's the formula for why I didn't take chemistry, but I believe that's the formula for wise ass. If you really want to be a wise ass with your lawyer and if you have a good reputation and a good relationship with them, uh, you just ask this simple question, which is, when's the last time a university lost its federal funding for violating FERPA? Because that's what lawyers will tell you the penalty is. You know, we're not going to violate FERPA because the penalty is losing all of our federal funding. Well, that's when you say, hey, just let me ask you, when's the last time that happened? Well, the answer is, it's never happened. It's never happened. I'm not encouraging you to violate FERPA. Please be clear. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. What I'm telling you is that the concerns about FERPA are often overdone. Overdone. Last point, and then we're getting close to questions coming up here. Uh, your lawyer is worried about your president saying things that are dumb. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good concern. <laughs> I love college presidents, but sometimes I feel like our job is to keep them away from the sharp objects. Uh, maybe that's just me because they're smart, well-meaning people who often are not media trained. And the key for you point, your, your, from your viewpoint, of course, is to convince your lawyer that, nope, that, that, that is not a reason for us not to talk to the press. That in fact, by creating what I call the traffic light grid of all the facts about this situation and training our president on what he or she can say and what they can't say. Red light stuff is we're never going to talk about. Yellow light facts from our situation could be talked about, but you know we'd rather not. And then green light are our key message points. I do a lot of training for university presidents to prepare them for difficult media um, media encounters. And this is exactly how I do it. Mr. President, Ms. President, over here is red light. We're not talking about that. Here's how you will bridge away from it. Yellow light, you can answer that question, but try to move quickly to green light, which is where we want to spend most of our time. Green light questions are things like hard work we've done, how we're trying to fix this, why we care, what our mission is, how important this is. Give them their green light sound bites, train, sound bites train, train them on those sound bites. Yellow lights are stuff like hypotheticals, which are dangerous, or 
bad facts that we'd rather not talk about unless we're bringing them up ourselves to inoculate or do away with the surprise factor. Their personal opinion is, can be yellow light, can be kind of dicey. Rumors are, we don't want to verify them. Process and procedure is okay to talk about, but it's not as good as green light. And then remind them then there are things in the red light category that we simply never talk about. We don't criticize victims, particularly sympathetic victims. We don't release, release privilege. The attorney will be happy that you are fighting with them arm in arm to protect their privilege and the confidences. We don't release investigative materials. We don't defame people and we don't lie. And so for each of the green light points, you can give your president different anecdotes or different memorable statistics or short little punchlines that will allow your president to meet the press about this high profile litigation or investigation or pro uh, protest and still come off in a way that will not make the lawyer worried. Make sure that they have more than just one soundbite because too much repetition can hurt. Having the president say the same soundbite over and over again can lead to its own sort of problems. So if we had a problem where someone sued us for sexual discrimination, like the example I gave you, one of our green light points might be this. All of our employees are trained on equal employment laws, and we encourage them to report discrimination. Rather than have your president repeat that soundbite over and over again each time he or she is asked, you could give that president two different anecdotes about how our training is so good. Here's one anecdote. Our, one of our trainers is an expert witness for the Justice Department. That's how good our training is. Here's another anecdote. One of our employees said it was the best training they've ever had and they appreciate how fair we are. That's two ways to talk about that. Maybe there's memorable statistics. We've done more training for treating employees fairly than any other training. Or if over the last decade, all the hours we've devoted to this would be enough for college credit. And then there's punchlines, just short and easy way to make the point that doesn't involve repeating the same thing over and over again. Working with your lawyer to train your president will give your lawyer comfort that we're not going to say things that are going to hurt the liability. Finally, be aware of the underdog swap. I go, I'm going through this quickly. I've, I've got a half a day and a full day where I do some of this stuff in greater detail and we practice. But the underdog swap is when someone is presenting themselves as a victim to you, it's your job to show another victim and swap out your victim for their victim, right? And so, for example, when someone is suing the university because they say you did something that you shouldn't have done and they're asking for half a million dollars, let's at least include in our response that that half a million dollars will come out of tuition and books and uh, better dorms and better facilities and better professors and that when we have to pay money out to defend what we believe are false allegations, there's another victim here, and that's the students, the people we're all committed to learning. So these tactics we've talked about will help you be a partner with your lawyer so it's not so combative. It's not so argumentative. I want you to be on the same side and working together. And this, of course, Andrea my uh, fighting blue hen University of Delaware friend. Uh, I am ready for some questions if we have some. And I will switch back to me. How about that? I'm going to click off. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, your screen looks, looks is <laughs> Got it. Ah, so what do you, so can you see me now or are you seeing you? Unfortunately, I'm seeing me. Huh, okay. So what do I need to do so I can see me? Um, click off screen share entirely. There we go. Hello. <laughs> okay, let's do some questions. Okay. Um, so I actually have a few questions. First off, you, when you began, you talked about how rarely universities are kind of sued for, sued um, for based on what people have, have necessarily said in the press. Or, or can you talk about... You know, have you ever experienced cases where press statements are have either created suits or been involved in suits? No, I've never seen a press statement turn into a lawsuit. I've seen it threatened that way, right? And I've seen it attempt to be introduced as evidence in the current lawsuit. So I'll give you an example. So let's say uh, we got Lucille Bluth, who's suing Banana Stand University. And in it, we point out that she, uh, we go out to press and we say, you know, she never 
uh, she never even worked in that building. She always worked in building A. She never worked in building B where she said the harassment took place. And let's say we say that to the press. If she has evidence that she in fact worked in building B, then our statement will be brought into court to show that we said something that wasn't true. It typically would not be a separate lawsuit against us. It would be a way of showing the judge or jury that somehow we were not being on the level in our press responses. One thing I didn't mention when I talked about civil lawsuits, and hold on to your, hold on to your banana stands here when you hear this, is about 99% of all civil litigation settles hardly ever do we actually go to court where there's a jury and we have the case resolved by a jury? Insurance companies and, and litigants prefer settlement. And now you have to expect that the case will settle, not go to a, a jury verdict. Actually, thinking of, of settlements, that brings me to my next question. Um, I've personally been in a situation where there is a settlement being negotiated. What do you recommend to individuals who may be asked whether um, whether it's for a press statement or even for you know talking points for the president or whatever communication it might be about an ongoing lawsuit when negotiations are happening we never want to hurt the negotiation just like we don't want to hurt our position in court in fact when i told you that 99 percent statistic and that's going to vary from state to state but it's going to be high 90s everywhere uh, it, in light of that 99 percent statistic that settled Arguably, settlement's more important to us than juries. And so if settlement's more important to us, if we are poking at the other side, if in addition to saying Lucille Bluth uh, is, uh, you know, is making things up, if we go on to say something like, she never did a single good thing for Banana Stan University ever. That might be true, and that's certainly our opinion. We're allowed to say our opinions. That's not something you can be sued for defamation for. It's your opinion. But it might so aggravate Lucille that she is unwilling to negotiate in good faith in our settlement. And so when you move into serious settlements, you ought to be dialing down the rhetoric. Having said that, when you're sued, the rhetoric is typically, look at this evil banana stand university, look at the terrible things they did. Nobody should send their students there because they're not safe or because they're full of sexual harassers or whatever. At that moment, your university deserves the response and no comment or we don't comment on ongoing litigation, fails. You are not defending the reputation of the university. You've got to get in there and arm wrestle with your lawyer. Sometimes I get hired for the sole purpose of arm wrestling with a lawyer because the lawyer can't talk Latin to me. Mm -hmm. I get brought in to make the lawyers, here's a secret about lawyers. Most lawyers think that non-lawyers are dumb or dumber than they are. And so by bringing another lawyer into the equation often evens the playing field and allows you to be able to say something. Um, I want to remind everyone watching that you can submit questions using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. So again, the hashtag is Higher Ed Live. So send questions in if you have them. Another question I have is, can you talk about defining what's in an educational record on your piece on FERPA? You used a higher, I used a high school example, but what would be something that would be a, an educational record on campus? And I'm really thinking of it from, um, which is, you know, you could find that there was a was a positive educational record that reinforced your the university stance um, and go down the route as you described about asking someone to waive their FERPA rights and being able to say that they would refuse to waive the FERPA rights. All of this is to ask what would at a higher ed institution be an educational record, um, you know, and is it defined only as grades and you know maybe some some evaluations in the academic sphere or would things like uh, student conduct and that sort of thing be under that same umbrella? The rule is a little different for, pro again, I'm not your lawyer. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. So always talk to your lawyer, seek your lawyer for qualified legal advice. Uh, the rule is a little different for private schools and public universities. Public universities where you are now, University of Delaware, or where, where I teach, all three places I teach, UNC Chapel Hill's public, Akron's public, and OSU, these are all public. They are subject to public records law, so they have obligations to release records that have to be balanced against FERPA. Uh, and so classic education records are everything to do with the educational progress of the student other than things like they graduated, which is, becomes something that we release publicly. Um, you mentioned disciplinary records. This has really been the closer, harder one. If you're a public university that's got a public police force 
that has the power of arrest that uh, enforces the laws or protects students on your campus, and they arrest somebody, that arrest is not going to be FERPA protected. When the power of government is used to engage with a student, you, typically you will not be able to protect that from release because of FERPA, even though these police officers are university employees. The closer call is I was an RA for three years, right? And so I would occasionally write up a student because they did something wrong. I was a hall director there at University of Delaware, so I had some students over there in Gilbert AB who were being a little naughty. You have to put them into the judicial system. And that's a closer call, right? In a private university, I think that's going to be protected. In a public university, it may not be. Ironically, it varies by state. I guess when I talk about FERPA, what I want you to do is I want you and your lawyer to walk through the pros and cons in front of the president or whoever the decision maker is, the dean, the chancellor, the, uh, the VP for student life, whoever the person is. I want you to walk through and make sure that everybody agrees that FERPA fully, fully covers the record that we want to release. And talking about redacting out personally identifiable information might be very helpful to you because you could release the rest of the record. So I would like your best of on two different topics. What are the best university statements you've seen on uh, two major topics happening at the moment? One being faculty members expressing their opinions on social media or other forums that might be completely out of line with what the university promotes. The second piece is um, statements that have been made about free speech issues on campus when it comes to speakers. Sure, two hot topics. Um, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to single out any individual client. I've, I've advised lots of private and public universities around the country, but I will say this: it seems like every week or two, some faculty member says something controversial. I gave you the example of the, the made-up example of a faculty member who thinks that all kittens should be drowned, right? Uh, when that happens, the first reaction is that person needs to be fired because they've said something that's so terribly offensive. Well, we, we as a university have legal obligations to make sure that we only fire people for reasons that we're allowed to fire them. So if there's a union contract, we got to follow the union contract. If there's tenure, we must follow tenure. If there are state collective bargaining or employee rights laws, we must follow those as well. So I would never suggest that you should short circuit that proce process simply because of something someone said. In the example I gave you of that teacher, that third or fourth grade teacher who was molesting little girls in the classroom, my advice really was just fire the guy. Let him sue you from jail. Just I know he's got tenure. Just fire the child molester and let him sue you. And of course, he never did because he was much more worried about going to prison for 20 years. So there are times when it's so agreed, just like a crime, where you might want to just sort of talk to the president about, go ahead, let's get sued. But when it's just something controversial, I think the best statements include things like this. Number one, you make a mission statement about how the free freedom of expression matters on our campus, right? And that's supposed to include all views, including those that we find repulsive, okay? And then number two, go ahead and call the view repulsive if you think it does not comport with the university views. You're allowed to say that a professor who wants to drown all kittens has a repulsive viewpoint. Now, having said that, when I sit with a college president and, and the college president wants to do that, particularly at a public school, I will say the following things. Are you square with your trustees before you say that? Are you square with state legislators who fund you when you say that? Are you square with the biggest donors, including the one who's not yet sent the check that's supposed to be coming in the next month to fund the new library wing? Before you go out sort of on your own and go, well, I as president am personally offended by that, and everybody cares about my personal views about what's offensive, you better be square with your key stakeholders like trustees, legislators, and donors before you go out and make that statement. Now, with respect to student um, protests and speaking on campus, uh, again, just my personal opinion, I think we have to stand squarely in favor of the First Amendment. I tell people, and I hear gasps in the room when I say this, if you're sued for First Amendment violations, it's essentially the same lawsuit as if you violated uh, racial discrimination laws. It's a civil rights lawsuit. The same federal statutes and the same, same federal court process will be in, in play because violating someone's First Amendment rights is a 
uh, what the what constitutional lawyers and judges call as a fundamental right. That's the term they use. And of course, the right not to be discriminated based on your race or your gender is also fundamental. So whenever we're talking about students on campus messing with their First Amendment rights, uh, outside of what's called time, place, and manner restraints, where we're allowed to say you can't have a bullhorn at three in the morning outside the dormitory, right? Doesn't matter whether you're saying God bless America or let's drown kittens. Uh, the, the the actual method you're doing it can be can be regulated. So our press statements need to acknowledge our mission of commitment to free speech and fairness. If we want to call somebody out as being outside of our values, we're allowed to do that too. I worry though. We saw this at Mizzou a couple years ago that if we um, if we aren't firm enough. In, in respect to some student demands, that the student demands get worse and worse and worse, and then huge ramifications for universities occur. What's happened at Mizzou is troubling to that great university. They've closed dormitories. They've lost funding. They've lost enrollment, largely because I think they didn't have a clear strategy from the outset. There was actually a fascinating piece that was put out by the Brookings Institute, I think last week or the week before. I don't know if you saw it, and we'll, and we'll tweet it out. We've already tweeted it out one that was talking about students, they did a representative sur survey of students around the country and their perceptions of the fr First Amendment. Um, I think it's definitely a, a read for everyone who's watching this webinar or hearing it on the podcast is definitely worth a, worth the perusal. We do have a question from Twitter. It came from Deanna, who is at Lewis University, and she's asking specifically about photography and video policies. Um, and the thought about what is necessary as far as waivers and sign-offs. Does a does a notice at the at the beginning of the event work? Does is something posted on the wall work at public events? Um, do you need a waiver from every person in the room? Can you please give some insights into that? And you're going to need to unmute unmute your. I did. Here we go. <laughs> Just call me to unmute. So I get this question a lot. Of course, state law varies. Of course, talk to your lawyer. In general, people have a right to not have their likeness used by your university. It's different for news stations. I know you say, Mark, what about that B-roll of fat people walking down the street in New York when they're talking about stories about obesity? Isn't that different? Well, it is different. The news gathering privilege is different for, certainly for private institutions, arguably for public and private. So you generally want people's permission before you use their likeness. It's a lot less troubling when you put it in social media, which is transient, it's out there and it goes away, than when you put it on the front cover of your view book or the front page of your advertising package where you're using that person's image over and over again. The, the more permanent the use, the more I want a very careful, significant release. The more casual use, you could put up a sign saying people in this area will be filmed and your, your image may be on social media. If you do not want to be, please stay out of this area. It's a great opportunity for you to work with your lawyer and partner with him or her to show that you care about their issues. So that idea that if you walk into a classroom and the students see you there taking photos, that's not an implicit agreement by them because I, I used to work in television news. So if you walked into a public space or even a private space, but the people saw that you were there, therefore they were giving, you know, you were allowed to film them because they were aware they were being filmed, basically. The case law gives more First Amendment rights to news gathering organizations like WCAU in Philadelphia or WHYY Radio, wherever it is, it gives them greater rights. If they were to be sued, they'd have much broader protections than a university would. And I think a university would have more broader protections than Pepsi or Coke or Ford or some private for-profit company that's using an image to advance a product. So it sounds like even though it's a little bit more of a hassle, if you walk into a classroom, for instance, and start taking photos, you should have all of the students in that room sign the sign the photo waiver. Right. Or sometimes what I'll do is you take the photo, because the first example was social media, and sometimes you're doing Facebook Live, or you're doing Periscope, or you're doing Instagram Live, or something else that's live, where you can't get that back. But if we find a photo that we just love, and there's someone whose face is so prominent in that photo, go to that person and get that written, written waiver. One face in the middle of a crowd, I'm less worried about that. Just as a lawyer, if, if I were giving legal advice in the states where I'm licensed to practice, I am less worried about crowd shots than I am when one person is prominent next to a brand. Okay, great. 
All right. So that, I think, wraps up our session for today. I want to thank our guest for joining us. You did a, we, I think I learned just a ton just speaking to you. Um, so thank you, Mark, for joining us. And as always, thanks to our program sponsor, PRSA's Counselors to Higher Education. Don't forget to follow and more importantly, engage with us on our social platforms on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Look for our profiles. And we appreciate everyone joining us for the special edition of Higher Ed Live. Have a great afternoon.